told us that we should learn how to chant the holy names of a baby crying for its mother. Sometimes when we're sitting in class and babies cry, we become annoyed. We think it's a great disturbance. Have any of you ever had that experience? But Krishna may be teaching us a more valuable lesson in that cry than we're learning in the class. Because when a baby cries for mother, she knows no other shelter. She realizes her dependence on the mother. When the baby is in danger, and it is confident I can't do it on my own. Maybe that's what we call the fire department or the police department or the military. Cries for money. And Draupadi, when she was in that assembly of the Kurus, feet did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> I wish the static in the mind was so easy to unplug. <laughs> Wisdom, Krishna will reveal wisdom in those situations. Nobody was helpless. She had strength. She had prestige. She had heroic husbands. <coughs> Nothing was there to help her. But she was at the moment of her greatest need. <coughs> she cried out Krishna's names. Hey Krishna, hey Govinda. Just like a baby in danger of Christ for mother. May Krishna appear and deliver her in the form of a beautiful, unending cloth sari. Krishna embraced her <coughs> with his grace. teaching of the Acharyas, especially Srimad Bhagavatam, how to find Krishna in whatever situation comes in our life, how to transform crisis into blessings, how to transform tragedies into benediction. Transform challenges into stepping stones for higher consciousness. <clears throat> Little Druva was just a five year old boy. And he was doing what any five year old boy would want to do find the approval, the affection of his father. regular old day at the palace. <coughs> it's like any other day. Little Drew was playing. And he wanted 
wanted to be with his father so bad. His father was sitting on the throne, and little Drew crawled up to, to, to climb onto his lap. And suddenly, his stepmother, Suruchi, screamed at him. Such a harsh, nasty voice. You have no right to sit on the throne with your father because you are born of another woman. If you want ever this privilege, you must die and take your next birth in my womb. So he looked at his father for shelter. This was painful. But his father did nothing. His father did not want to please his wife. It too was. A lot of complications. <laughs> don't, don't try it. <laughs> Either way. So Truba felt totally betrayed. And for the human psyche, this is one of the most painful sufferings of the heart. Is to feel betrayed by somebody that you have trusted. Betrayed by someone that you've placed that vulnerable essence of the heart, your love. And a five-year-old child, he had nowhere else. He was mortified. He looked at his father with such innocent desperation. <clears throat> Is it true that I'm such a useless piece of trash? I'm just like a piece of garbage to be spit out because I'm born of somebody else's womb. Is that true, Father? <clears throat> Are you going to help me? The Father looked away, confirming everything the stepmother said. The Father, you know, Man, you have this male ego sometimes. Usually, women can detect it better than us because, of, because it's our ego. <laughs> but anyways, that's a long story. <laughs> um, he really didn't think that much of it. He thought, oh, now my wife is acting like this and my son is realize that his, his neglecting his son totally tore his heart to pieces. Krupa began to cry and he ran. He ran to his mother. So he Drupal couldn't even speak. He was heaving, breathing so deeply, heaving <coughs> in anguish. Hot tears pouring out of his eyes. Lips trembled. He could not speak a word. And somebody from the palace told her what happened. And when she saw her son in this state, a loving mother seeing a five-year-old child in this condition, betrayed, broken-hearted, lost, desperate, her face became like a lotus flower, shriveled by the burning sun. She lost her heart practically. And she said, Drew, unfortunately, it's true. 
your father doesn't favor. But actually, <clears throat> what your stepmother said is true. She told you, if you take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, if you pray to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, to the Lord, then you could die and take birth, both for birth from her womb. Take the good from that. All your desires could be fulfilled if you just take shelter of the Lord. She found a bit of wisdom, even in the most angry safe statement, where there was no intention of wisdom. Who said, I want a kingdom greater than my father or my grandfather. <coughs> my mother said, by taking shelter of Lord Krishna, all our desires could be fulfilled. Great sages since time immemorial have found that shelter by going to the forest. Jopa didn't say another word. He ran out of the palace, ran out of the kingdom, ran into the forest, deeper, deeper, deeper. He ran so fast, nobody knew, nobody knew what he was doing or could follow. Jopa didn't say another word. And we were talking about what forests were like those days. Tigers, elephants, lions, leopards, panthers, snakes. Mosquitoes, a lot of nice blizzards. He was born and raised in a beautiful palatial building with all luxuries. And now he's living alone as a five year old boy. And he ran into the darkest places of the forest where no humans would dare to tread. He was seeking God. <laughs> Such determination. When the father found out about it, he looked, he sent people out to try to find you, but he was gone. And then he realized what he had done. Another element of human nature. Sometimes due to our attachments, Sometimes the tap due to egos. We don't realize what we're doing till, till there's a disaster. And we start rethinking. What did I say? What didn't I say? He was he was devastated. I did this to my son. My little beautiful son, I hurt him so bad that he rejected home to live in the jungle. Parents, how would you feel about that? They you hurt your child so bad at that age, they reject everything. in the heart of every living thing he knows our he knows the sincerity of our purpose. So Krishna he sent his devotee Narini into the forest to show them the way to Krishna. Because Druva didn't know him. <laughs> he was just in the jungle looking for Krishna. <laughs> And now he reappeared in the most unlikely place. He told Ruba, the lion was so disturbed. You know, you're just a child. So you get insulted, go home, play, forget about it, you'll get over it. <clears throat> he started telling him about how saintly people are not disturbed by praise or blame. And Drupal listened. 
And he said, whatever you say is true. But it doesn't, it doesn't touch my heart. I'm hurt too bad. Your philosophy doesn't reach my heart. What is the use of philosophy unless it touches your heart? When our Ramoni told him, okay, I will tell you how to fight Krishna. <laughs> you are definitely sincere. <clears throat> and that's what he initiated Rupa. He gave him the mantra. Just paint. People say, what is it? It's just paint. It's 
same paint and paints walls. How is this God? Krishna promises. Bhaktaram Pushpam Balanto Yam Yami Bhakta Prayachit. Something is offered to me with love and devotion, I accept. And one time Prabhupada was challenged, how could Krishna be in a deity? Krishna's everywhere. Krishna's everywhere. Why are you worshiping deity? The Prabhupada said, if Krishna's everywhere, he's also in the deity. But we can focus our total love and devotion in making an offering. It's hard to do that. To everywhere. Yeah. But we fulfill. When you water the root of the tree, you water everyone in the tree. When Krishna is satisfied, we fulfill everything. The little Truva just has little muddy duties. God in the sun, and we offer flowers, and leaves, and so many things. And after some time, he became so advanced in the open process. He didn't even drink water, or leaves, or fruits. He just breathed. <clears throat> Through the open process in very advanced stages, you can develop the city, the perfection. Or you could you can extract all the vitamins, minerals, proteins, nutrients, everything your body needs from the air by breathing. Wouldn't that be incredible? But it's not as nice as eating good massage. <laughs> I go beyond. <laughs> <laughs> he developed in his chanting of this mantra and performing. He was so intense, so determined. After some time, he stopped even breathing. <laughs> and he performed a very difficult asana. He stood on one toe. He <laughs> wasn't like a ballerina, he was standing on the toe. And his body was is immovable as a stone pillar. Not a single limb moved even slightly as he stood on his toes without breathing. And he was like that for weeks. Totally immersed according to Nardanoi's instruction, on meditation, the beautiful Lord of the heart, within his heart. And as he chanted, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, and was worshiping the beautiful form of the Lord within his heart in his meditation, something incredible happened. It wasn't on the basis of his austerity. It wasn't on the basis of his renunciation. It was on the basis of his sincerity. He was expressing his sincerity through this process. But Vishnu, Lord Narayan, actually appeared within his heart. Dhruva, whose eyes were closed, who was standing like this on a toe, seeing the Lord within his heart. All of his desires, all of his anxieties, everything disappears. Krishna Surya Sam Mayohaya presence of the sun, darkness cannot exist. Anxiety, fear, misery, 
envy and greed, all this stuff. It's just byproducts of darkness. It cannot exist in the sun. He was in ecstasy. Totally absorbed in drinking the nectar of the Lord's form through his the intimate love of his father. Suddenly, Krishna disappeared from his heart. This is called Samboga Vibralamba. He became so deeply, deeply attached to the Lord when the Lord disappeared. He couldn't continue his meditation. In that shock, after weeks, he opened his eyes. And what he saw was a great miracle. <laughs> the same exact form of the Lord that he was worshiping with his love in his heart was now physically standing right in front of him. And he was seeing him with these eyes. First he was seeing him with his eyes closed inside. Now he's seeing him with his eyes open outside. And when the group was only five years old, usually you start school around five or six. Yes. So he was not educated yet. He wanted to offer beautiful prayers. But he didn't know poetry. He didn't know Sanskrit much. He, he wanted to express so many words of gratitude and love through his, what was in his heart. <coughs> Krishna understood his desire and smiled. He took his conch shell and placed it on Trupa's head. Just touched it. And in doing so, empowered Trupa to be able to verbalize the feelings of his heart. The wisdom that was revealed to him. Trupa offered Beautiful poetic prayers. Even now, ages and ages and ages later, great scholars, yogis, saints, devotees recite these prayers as a great source of inspiration and knowledge. Magnificent Sanskrit poem with such philosophical precision and such pure spiritual emotion. And this little five-year-old boy in the jungle. <coughs> and the Lord was so pleased with Truva. He said, I will fulfill your desire. You came to the forest because you wanted a kingdom greater than your father or grandfather. I will give it to you. Just ask. And Jehovah Maharaj replied, I came looking for broken pieces of glass. But by your grace, the most precious diamond. Once experiencing the love, the grace, the sweetness, and the beauty of the supreme personality of God, even the greatest fortune kingdoms and powers and wealth had no more value than broken pieces of glass. Now sometimes if glass is like a bottle or something, you can get a deposit or a refund maybe in the old days. <laughs> but what can you do with a broken piece of glass? They're dangerous, they 
got you. They don't know that. But the love for Krishna, to feel that, to feel Krishna's love, and to awaken our love, and to have that enthusiasm to serve, that is a priceless, precious time. In fact, Lord Chaitanya called Prema Bhakti the Purusharpa Siromani. It means the crest jewel of all perfections in life. Just three days ago, I was in the British Museum. How I got there was kind of strange. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mind if I differ from the story? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> they help help her get his 26 second out of a little store punch. And then Mukunda Maharaj had some friend named Shamsundar. His name was Sam in those days. And he was living California. His girlfriend, Malachi. And he said to Prabhupada, you know, the Lower East Side is a good place. Hey, Ashbury will be a great place. That was like the Mecca for hippies. <laughs> the Prabhupada said, yes, go start a center there. So the Guru Maharaj went and joined his friend, Shamsundar, and then Yamuna Devi, she was. She was a friend of Shamsundar from the same little town of Salem, Oregon, from their early childhood. When you see these devotees, these really senior devotees, especially these ones, come together, really, really sweet. Yamuna Devi, she 
was ill last night. Of course, she passed away. One of the most precious souls in the history of this world. She passed away last year. But earlier, she was in a Bhakti Vedanta hospital in Bombay for about four months. And Shamsuri Prabhu spends a lot of time with us there, Radhika Gopinath So we went together to see Yamuna. And they started talking about old times. <laughs> they were talking about their services to Prabhupada and what incredible services they did for Prabhupada together. Unbelievable. They started San Francisco, they started London, they started India. <laughs> Sunya Prabhu was Prabhupada's person. Secretary Amuna Devi was Prabhupada's person. Cook, Guru Das, Mukunda Maharaj, Janaki, what they were doing. So Sham Sundar was reminding Yamuna, do you remember when we were in grade school together? How we always talked about spiritual topics and nobody else was interested except the two of us. <laughs> and so the woman would have the seat right in front of Shamsundar, and she had pigtails. And Shamsundar, without her knowing, would tie her pigtail hair, braided hair, and her braids, I don't know what we call them here, but he would tie her braids to the back of her chair. <laughs> was over and everyone had to leave, she would like stand up ah! <laughs> and the teacher was, why are you making noise in the class? <laughs> she would always get her in trouble. And they were they went back that far. Anyways, um, they started in San Francisco. They had a big Mantra rock dance, where they got all the biggest bands in America to come and play for free to help raise funds for Shiva Prabhupada's new little storefront, which is about a third the size of this room. And one day, um, I saw this letter. Shiva Prabhupada writes a letter to Mokuni. Now he's Goswami. And said, Sean Sundar wrote me a letter and said he would like to go to London to bring the Beatles to Krishna consciousness. He said, I think it's a good idea. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this is how they thought in those days. They were really, you know, as they say, out of the box. <laughs> from those days of the Beatles. Well, at a certain point, they were so popular. They were so famous. In America, in England, in Germany, anywhere they went, that wherever they went, there would be thousands of people screaming hysterically and trying to touch them. Whatever. They were the first rock and roll band to play in a stadium. That was historical. Shea Stadium in New York City. And the people, there were tens of, I think like 30, 40,000 people, I don't know how many there were, but they were all screaming. And they couldn't even hear themselves playing. <laughs> and you know, it was kind of depressing for them because, you know, they're musicians. <laughs> They've come to share the art of their music. You know, they're spending their lives writing songs and practicing, and everybody's screaming so loud, and nobody, nobody cared about their music. <laughs> so it came to the point where they made no public appearances. They would just make write songs and record them in the studios, and that was all. Nobody could meet the people. Their first record in America was Meet the Beatles. But after some time, no one was allowed to meet the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Well, they were the hardest people in the world to reach. And they went to London. They had no money. You all know the story how they got in? If any of you read the journey home, it was really difficult to get in London in those days. <laughs> took a flight to Luxembourg. It was $65. It was stop in Iceland. <coughs> and then uh, we had no money, myself and my friend, Mary. And we didn't know where to go. We didn't know anybody. Our friend who was supposed to be sponsoring us got robbed and he left the first day. So we met some people from Amsterdam. And they came up to us because they thought we looked pretty strange. <laughs> we had long hair, and they had long hair. And they never met long-haired people from America. So we were kind of like, I guess, cool. <laughs> 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 and there I am anyway. <laughs> we weren't actually like that. And we got there and I was sitting there 